All right, and we're recording. Hey gang, Andy here. And I'm here to address some issues that I have with uh, so-called full-time content creators. But before we get into that, I want to uh, address another issue that's been coming up in the comments a lot. Not only in my videos, but uh, in other people's videos as well, and in blogs and whatnot. And that is the validity, or lack thereof, of a full-time content creator being an actual job. Is making YouTube videos an actual J-O-B job? And I'm here to tell you that as long as you're making money in a perfectly legal fashion and you're able to pay your bills, then it's a job. There's <laughs> there's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. It's a J-O-B job. Uh, where a lot of people get their panties in a bunch about it is the fact that in most people's cases, if they start making money off of making YouTube videos, it's uh, as like a part-time or maybe a supplemental income. And that's perfectly fine too. If you just want to do this as a hobby, or maybe as like a good part-time supplemental income, like I said, then that's perfectly fine too. There's nothing wrong with that. Or even if you don't want to make money, if you just want to do this strictly for fun, that's also fine too. But there are those who want to go the extra mile, who want to just make YouTube videos, or just write blogs, or both and make money that way. And if they're able to connect to such an audience or find means to do so, then good on you. This video is here to address five issues that I have with uh, full-time content creators. So with that said, let's begin. The top five things full-time content creators are doing wrong. And these are in no particular order, by the way, so let's begin. Number one, they don't have their finger on the pulse. Now, to paraphrase a quote that Wayne Gretzky said, you should go not for where the puck is, but for where it's going to be. I see this a lot with uh, established content creators. Um, let's use Linkara as an example, since he's been a pretty uh, hot topic lately. I mean, I've already made two videos about his, uh, his recent money woes, so let's use him as an example. He got famous for his Atop the Fourth Wall video series as well as History of Power Rangers, which I personally enjoy. The top of the fourth wall for me, eh, kind of hit or miss. But that's neither here nor there. He originally started doing written comic book reviews, and that was what he cut his teeth on. Then he started making video versions of those reviews, which eventually evolved into a top of the fourth wall. And, you know, he got his pacing and his timing down, and he improved on the quality of equipment, um, he was able to put in props, use some green screen effects, and etc. to build up the product to a quote-unquote professional grade. The thing is, initially the video series was very successful. It was a big hit. A lot of people really liked what they saw. But over time, he fell into a format. And he started becoming very predictable. And people didn't even need to watch the video to know what was going to go on. They just needed to read the title and maybe the description, and they got the basic gist of the video. Okay, Linkara is going to review another bad comic, he's going to yell a lot, he's going to be very condescending, and at the end of the video, he's going to hold the comic book high, and he's going to proclaim, THIS COMIC SUCKS! Throw it down on his couch, and walk off in disgust. That's it. That's all his The Top of the Fourth Wall videos are. Predictable, they have their own format. And, I mean, that works for a time. But eventually, you have to evolve. You have to see what the next big thing is. See where not only the eyeballs are at that moment in time, but where they're going to be. What trends are gonna pop up that are gonna make people go, ooh, I wanna watch that. That looks interesting. You always have to have your finger on the pulse. Because the minute you take your finger off the pulse, somebody else who's a lot hungrier than you and wants it more than you, is gonna kick your ass. And you're gonna start losing your viewers to that guy. Because people are gonna watch him. Because he, he's entertaining. And he's the next thing. So what I would recommend to Linkara in that case is to, when viewership is starting to decline, start experimenting. Start putting some different ideas out on the side. You know, continue to do a top the fourth wall. You know, continue doing your thing. But do some videos on the side. Do something else. See what sticks. If you get a good idea that sticks, run with it. You know, whether or not you decide to cancel a top of the fourth wall to work on that video series full time, that's your call. If you want to do it, go for it. If you don't, that's fine too. Always go for where the puck's gonna be. 
Don't continue to follow the trends. Don't continue to be predictable. Number two, they don't have professional or at least good equipment. And I see this a lot with uh, amateur uh, vloggers. You know, they, they're just working with an old webcam from 1998 that barely works, and the audio is shitty, and the lighting is poor, and it's just a big mess to watch. For the average Joe YouTuber, or somebody who isn't doing it for the money and isn't doing it full time, it's a little more forgivable in the grand scheme of things. For somebody who's out there proclaiming themselves to be a YouTube pro or a professional vlogger and stuff like that, if they're running on an old shitty ass 240p shitty crackly audio webcam in a dirty ass room with poor lighting, then it's downright insulting. It's embarrassing to the ones who actually put in the work, the ones who actually put a lot of detail into their presentation. They have lighting, they have top-end gear, and it's just embarrassing to call yourself a professional vlogger with such a shitty setup. Now, of course, you can go on to the other extreme side of things. You know, you don't necessarily have to have that $2,000 or $3,000 camera and this $3,000, $6,000 plus lighting setup, soundstage, and all this other stuff to make a good video. Now, just to take myself for an example, the camera that I'm shooting this video on right now is a Canon PowerShot SX230HS. It's a slightly older PowerShot model, maybe like a year, maybe two years old. It records video really good, it records audio very good. Is it the best camera out there? No, but it works. I mean, you can see me just fine, you can hear me just fine. It works for me. Will I eventually upgrade? Of course. This camera only costs me 200, 250 tops. Not all that much in the grand scheme of things. I mean, it's a little above an entry model for a point and shoot camera. For doing these kinds of videos, the talking head, you know, just me and the camera kind of videos, it works. You honestly don't need anything more than that. Now, I know that there are YouTubers out there who use DSLRs and a lot of high-end gear to record just basic videos like this, and that's fine too. But my point is you don't necessarily need that to record a video. You just need something that sounds good and looks good. So that way you can present it in such a way that, say you have a web series that's gaining in popularity, it's got a good solid fan base, and you want to present it to a bunch of execs who want to either pick up your show and put it on a network, or you know maybe they want to sponsor your show and you put together like a little demo reel or like a compilation so they can get an idea of who you are and what your product is, would you feel embarrassed to display your product to a bunch of suits in an exec room? 